Hello and welcome to our first, our second LOTAD Digital Residency Pro Talk. My name is Sylvia Arthur and I'm the founder of the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora here in Accra, Ghana. The LOTAD Digital Residency is a five month remote residency that brings together three of the most inquiring young minds in African and diaspora, literature, libraries and archives in a virtual think tank to postulate new African futures using indigenous knowledge as a foundation. The residency provides an opportunity for emerging professionals in their fields to benefit from LOTAD's unique resources and community and network with professionals in related areas. David Affili has extensive experience in web librarianship, establishing di digital libraries, systems administration and management, and user research. He is the founder of Digital Citizens, an organization geared towards the digital transformation of Africans, the underserved, the underprivileged and non-digital natives. He has trained over 200,000 people in the efficient use of various technologies, including library technologies, work technologies and educational technologies. And he has provided training for organizations, including universities, telecommunications companies, embassies and professional associations. His academic training is in library and information science, business technology management, and computer science. He was listed among Elsevier's most creative librarians in the world, which led to his recruitment as an innovation explorer for Elsevier in 2011. Tonight, David will be in conversation with our LOTAD digital librarian in residence, Ada Chukwu Onwadiwe. So without further ado, Ada, over to you. Sorry, I forgot I was on mute. Hello, David. Hi, Ada. Um, so, welcome to Lotta Pro Talk. And um, anyway, I, I, you, you want to share your screen, right? Mention something like that. Yeah, when we get to that part. All right. So, um, David, um, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. It's an honor. You know, I've always loved your work. So, um, <laughs> Thank you for so um, from the brochure, um, we're going to be discussing Africanizing, libra um, Africanizing libraries, um, but we're going to be focusing on the blockchain technology. So okay. for me, why I am sort of interested in the blockchain technology is because of the way we've adopted it in this part of the world. So it's like every, people just think that blockchain only has to do with cryptocurrency, and all that, but I feel like there is so much that can be done with it because um, considering how um, decentralized the system is. But at the same time, I have my own misgivings. I have questions about the, you know, adopting blockchain technology, especially for libraries in Africa. Yes, crypto is all well, um, you know, adopted and all that. But in terms of, um, you know, digital literacy, how people approach digital literacy here. I think it's easy for people to, whenever something has to do with money, it's easy for them to like rush to it. So um, it's easy for people to rush to cryptocurrency because it's all about money. But when it comes to um, you know, books, libraries, you don't know the story. So, um, these are the questions I sent to you. I know it's all over the place, but I think we can just take it one step at a time and try to understand what blockchain technology is all about and how you know the library can fit in before we now get into other questions. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ada, and uh, thank you, Sylvia, and everyone for having me. Um, I like talking about technology, and um, currently I like talking about blockchain and green library technologies. Mm -hmm. So I'll share my screen um, quickly when, um, so I'll just put up something that I have got for us. Um, so please, you're gonna pardon my slide. At first, I just wanted to do a talk, uh, but I realized that it could be a bad idea just doing a talk without showing my slides or showing something on the screen. So um, I'm gonna, uh, sorry. So I believe that we all see my screen. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just uh, something that I put together this evening. 
Uh, so it's not a very beautiful slide. Um, I'm, I'm not usually bad in design, so just this is simple. All right. Um, I'm just going to quickly break down blockchain for us so we understand it. But if after explaining it to us, you still don't understand, uh, please just take it that um, you it's it's one of those things you know blockchain is something that you have to think about uh, go back to the books over and over and over again before you get it but i'm going to try to make it so simple so everyone understands yeah so let's start with what blockchain is not uh blockchain is not bitcoin you know that's a misconception that many people have a lot of people think when you think about blockchain uh, the next thing that comes to your mind is cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all of that. Uh, blockchain is not synonymous to Bitcoin or crypto assets, or, you know, but, but blockchain actually is um, the technology that makes Bitcoin rock, you know, and blockchain, um, when it was adopted, the concept of blockchain Blockchain has been there. It wasn't called blockchain anyway. It was just a concept, a way of, you know, time stamping stuff, uh, records, information, whatever. But in 2009 or eight, I guess, when um, someone by the name Satoshi uh, uh, actually gave it the name of blockchain and we started adopting it for Bitcoin and all of that, uh, it was then built to serve as a publicly distributed ledger. Um, or as a public transaction ledger for Bitcoin, you know? So I'm going to explain this so that we understand, but it is not Bitcoin. It is just the technology behind that powers Bitcoin, you know? So um, a ledger, it's one of the best ways we can explain blockchain. I believe that virtually all of us, or all of us here, we've worked with a ledger at one point or the other, you know, in our lives or in our career. Um, let's just look at this background. I've got something here like a register. This is a ledger. Um, so uh, let's assume that we are in this meeting together, all of us right now. We are a team, let's say board members or something. And we agreed that we've got a secretary that is writing. And then we all agreed that uh, the first thing that's going to appear on our ledger is our opening balance. And we say, okay, put in the opening balance and we agree on what our opening balance should be. Let's say um, 10,000 cities, $10,000, 10,000 pounds or whatever, or Naira. Now we put it there. The moment that we agree, the moment we make a decision and we agree, all right? This is just one sheet that we are working with here. This ledger is just what we are working with. But the moment all of us agree, that this is what our opening balance is. Imagine this one sheet uh, is uh, copies of it are made by the secretary and it is sent to everyone in this meeting. So we've all got the copy of this. But remember that the only thing we've got in this ledger at this point in time is the opening balance, right? Then we go over to the next step. Uh, we agree on something else. We say, okay, let's put our ex expenditure for the year. And we agree on what our expenditure, our total expenditure will be um, for the year. The moment that we all agree and we, we, the secretary puts it down there in the ledger. Though for the secretary, it is just one copy, this same ledger that they are working on. But instead of having a ledger that has got an opening balance and an expenditure for the year, the opening balance is one copy that is sent to everybody. Then another copy of this ledger is created and sent to everybody again as copy two. So we've got copy one of the ledger, we've got copy two of the ledger, the same ledger that's supposed to be one document or one um, sheet or something. Now we get to a point, the secretary says, no, no, there is a mistake somewhere. We've been working with the wrong information. Let's discard this ledger totally. Let's destroy this. We squash it and we throw it into the trash bin. Now, um, there is no ledger anymore, but in blockchain, there's actually a ledger the, 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 that we have agreed to destroy it. That decision, every time we make a decision to do something, that decision to delete it, to destroy it becomes copy three of the same ledger. So I've got copy one of this ledger, I've got copy two, what happened, copy three. And remember, or uh, mind you, Every copy you've got has got a timestamp, 
who made the decision, who actually deleted it, and for what reasons uh, it was deleted. Now we have deleted that copy. There is no, that ledger doesn't exist anymore in the human world, but in Bitcoin or in blockchain, it exists. The deleted copy is copy three. Now we have a fresh ledger. We are starting all over. Um, that fresh ledger, we have a new opening balance. That new opening balance, instead of it to be a new copy altogether, it becomes copy four. And copy four is sent to everybody. All right, so we keep record, we keep track of every single thing we have been doing, including the time that we destroyed it. We keep track of everything. Then we, we move uh, to the next step. At that next step, we, we agree what the next step is. It becomes copy five. And again, we now say, no, there is a mistake in copy four. Let's edit copy four quickly. And whatever change we make to copy four affects copy five. So there's no copy five anymore because we've made a change to copy four. Now, uh, there is nothing like a change in blockchain technology. That change you make, so long as we have all agreed that we should make a change, it becomes copy six of the same document, of the same ledger. And every time we agree on something, it is sent to everybody, copy seven, and we have a final document. Uh, instead of it to be just one document, we've made all the changes, we've deleted stuff, we've added stuff, it's just one document. That final document becomes copy eight of that same document. So you see that every single thing that we have been doing uh, is registered as a new document of its own. So this is just an idea what blockchain is. So I'm going to use this picture quickly uh, to, to explain it. Now, uh, first and foremost, just this is a block. The block basically in blockchain is a record. Every time we make a decision, uh, we record it. Uh, it's a record, it's information. Now that information, what I need also to understand that is always distributed, is always distributed. And everyone has a copy. So there is no central control. The secretary uh, that created the ledger is not our boss. Uh, we don't have a boss anywhere. Everyone is part of the network. So even if one person decides I'm no longer a part of this board or this meeting and you pull out, it doesn't affect anything because the, the copy, the, all the copies were distributed to everybody. So it is distributed. You can't destroy anything because that act of destroying, every time we decide to destroy, a new copy is created. A new block is uh, created. So it is immutable, actually. You can't destroy anything. You can't rewrite any, anything. And it is time stamped. But every time we make a decision, a new block is created and the time it was created is there. So it is just a transparent kind of system. And for every time a block is created, everybody in the system must agree. It's a unanimous decision. It is called consensus in blockchain technology. Everybody agrees, you know, so uh, it, it is there. So we're gonna talk about each of these as we go on. Um, then crypto cryptography is actually the chain. It is what binds all the blocks together. Now, everybody in the system is anonymous. When we say anonymous, it doesn't mean that you can cheat or something. You actually have a pseudonym or a way you identify yourself. But that way you identify yourself, we know that it is you. It verifies you. Not you as a person, but your device that actually takes part in the system. It verifies that device. Now, everything is secure. Now, let's assume that this is a block of information. A hash, when we say hash, it means that it is, it is kind of passworded. Let's say it is encrypted. That's the word. The data here is encrypted. And the encryption is done by, you don't actually know what the computer uses, but we know that the encryption of the previous block is part of the encryption of this new block. So everything is encrypted together. So if a hacker, for, for instance, tries to hack this block, steal our information and all of that. Let me tell you what happens, why blockchain is interesting. The activity of that hacker becomes a new block. You know, it is create a new block is mined to say that this person or something, somehow this block will try to, and let's assume that hacking is possible and you hack something, but the way you hacked it, what you hacked and everything, a new block is mined for that your activity. 
You know, so it is almost indestructible because everything you do, a new block is mined for it. So it is just open, it is transparent, and you can program a blockchain. So I'll talk about programming when we go detail into libraries. So basically, this is just um, what a what blockchain is all about. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. So simply, let me end with this. Um, see blockchain as a chain of blocks holding immutable information distributed across a network of participants. Or you see it as a technology of trust where there is arguably no room for dishonesty in transactions because everything is open and everyone has got a copy of everything that happens, including your activity of trying to change something. A new block is created for that your activity. So you, you basically cannot um, cheat. Uh, I hope I have not confused us. Thank, thank you. But as we talk more, we are going to understand it. Um, so thank you so much for that. So my next question is, so as you were um, talking, it just occurred to me that I, each time, like, I keep watching videos on, on blockchain and each time I do, it feels like um, I have to learn more, like I have to learn more to understand. But yeah. I, I'm, so can we just be a little bit practical? Um, okay. So let's look at the library now. Let's use, um, well, let's use a um, library of Africa. Now, so let's say Library of Africa decides they want to set up a digital library for their community and they want to use a blockchain. What does it look like? Because when you, you know, when you talked about how, you know, different people coming together to agree. Yeah, I understand the process. Like when I understand it in the sense of crypto, cryptocurrency, I understand it in the sense of that. But okay. for an, an organization deciding, okay, we want to use blockchain to distribute books. You know, to people. Now, my first question is: What, okay, in terms of practically um, being practical, how does it? What will it look like? The second thing question is: um, It will come. It left me to come again, but let's just deal with the first one. Okay, so you actually want to implement um, uh, you, you, your library, for instance. Let's take uh, your library, yeah. for instance. Yeah, you want to now adopt this technology uh, for mm -hmm. your activities and all of that. So how you are going to go about uh, implementing it. So uh, basically, um, what you need to do basically is this. Um, okay, I, I think it will be easier for me to explain from the point of a library, all libraries um, yeah, this time. Yeah, all libraries. Yeah. Yeah, our libraries this time. So uh, basically what you need to do is, first you, you decide what particular service do you want to put on the blockchain technology? Um, do you just want to go, uh, you, 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 it's not easy to just move all out into blockchain technology mm -hmm. and all of that. So there are platforms already. So I'll give you some examples of library activities that thrive on blockchain technology. So it will give you um, an idea. For instance, I mentioned um, smart contracts when we're talking about blockchain is uh, programmable. Now, one of the ways you do, of course, you, you come into the platform, maybe you there, there are several software that you have to download and you start you know, operating on this platform, or you can decide to program your platform by yourself. If you've got the skills or you've got the technical people who can program the platform. But then this is all you need to understand. First and foremost, it doesn't have, your users don't have anything to do with the blockchain technology. What users actually need to understand is the service that we are looking for is available. The product we are looking for, the book we are looking for, the information we need is available. They don't care what technology you use or how you're giving them that information. Okay. So you, that is the library right now. So what particular service do you want to put on this technology? Number one, if we're talking about smart contracts, for instance, let's look at library acquisition. You acquire books, let's take Library of Africa now. You acquire books written by people of African descent and all of that. And some of these books are rare. Some of these books are books that are not anywhere. And, all of that. and you need more of this book. So one of the ways that you implement that on blockchain technology is this. Now, there are people that are already on the network, the blockchain network. There are people that are already doing stuff. So now you have come in, you, you have a software actually that you're using to transact or to do anything. You have come into the network. Now, um, you've also got some Bitcoin or something because that's the way you make payments for service and all of that. So instead of 
having middlemen, for instance, like in libraries generally, you'd want to, um, you want a vendor, a book vendor, you want a publisher or something to supply you some books and all of that. But smart contracts, for instance, you could go to the platform, you program your platform to say, these are the books that we want. This should be the quality of the book. It must be hardcover. It must be published this year. Someone of African descent and all of that. You put that contract out there. You don't care about who actually does the supply, who actually gives you the book, all right? The contract is there. Whoever meets your specification, the system does transaction, does business with that person. And once the person's transactions meet all your specification, your system that you have programmed pays the person, all right? In Bitcoin or whatever currency that you have or you trade with, pays the person. The person has supplied your books to you and the system just knows that, okay, this transaction is complete and I have to pay this person and all of that. You know, that is one way. Now, another way, let's look at um, all our collections. For instance, we, if you have a library man management software in your library, for instance, where all your books are that users actually use to check your catalog, to know what you've got in your collection. You know, so one thing that, uh, one way you can implement uh, blockchain, uh, use blockchain technology in that angle is this. Now you've got all your records on your library management software, but your library management software runs on blockchain technology. The user don't, doesn't have to know this. Library staff may not actually know this, but they've got a technology that they are working with, right? Now you've got your, your software on the technology and all your records are there. If you have say levies, people pay to use your books and all of that. And you've got a staff, for instance, that uh, maybe does some stuff. Okay, let me use a, an academic library, for instance. In ac academic libraries, people pay for overdue charges. You're supposed to pay a particular fine when you don't return the book, when you should return the book. Now, but there are some library staff who are fond of you know, manipulating stuff. Because this guy is my friend and he has returned the book late, instead of him to pay $1,000, somehow I make him pay $500 and all of that. Now, let's remember that this is blockchain technology. This is digital transaction we are doing. This is not physical transaction we are doing. For every single thing that you do, how you do it, it is recorded. It is time stamped. So you cannot cheat actually, you know, on this platform. So when someone tries to say, um, somebody's supposed to pay this levy and the person is supposed to pay it in Bitcoin or in Ethereum and all of that, the person cannot pay short of the money because it is recorded. But physically, people can actually do, um, because this person is actually paying from their own Bitcoin wallet to you direct, directly, all right? So every single thing that you do is recorded. Every single thing that you do is implemented. So like I said, for instance, it depends on what service that you actually want to put on the platform. Lastly, I'm going to explain one. This is not a library thing. Let's take voting, for instance, if you're voting in an election, for instance, and we use Bitcoin, to organize uh, voting. Everyone votes on the system. Uh, you can't rig the election because when you try to rig the election, when you try to destroy records, when you try to invalidate votes, the system creates a block for that your action of invalidating votes. The system creates a, a, a new block for you trying to rig the election. So the system creates a block for every single activity you do. So for, for, for libraries right now, it's all about transparency, basically. It's about transparency. And another way is removing middlemen from transactions that you do. And your users don't have to communicate with you, the, the librarian in residence, um, directly. Your user can actually do be, uh, transactions with the library. When we talk about the library, the library is digital. The library is on blockchain technology. You can actually transact with your library directly. There is no middleman. There is nobody saying come tomorrow for the book and all of that. So the user has direct access to whatever they are doing. So they don't have to talk to you and all of that. So these are some of the ways that libraries have adopted it um, currently. So thank you so much for that, because this basically covers our second question, which is um, how, how do you think te blockchain technology will revolutionize, revolutionize the public and commercial libraries? 
um, it reminds me of the whole um, uh, problem that um, the Internet Archives is having with the big C's, the big C's publishers. So I'm thinking if with a system like this and you know, eliminating the middlemen, it means that um, librarians and libraries have access to you know, a platform where they can gather enough data and you know, materials that they can give to their users. So I think, um, okay, okay, yeah. So yes. So, exactly. so yeah, basically, let me just add one thing. Let's take a let's take a system where um, you you publish an article, for instance. Uh, if if you've done academic academic publishing, you publish an article uh, with a journal, and you the the publisher of the no you that is the author of the article. Yeah. So long as it has been published, you don't have access to it anymore. All right. So we've seen situations where authors actually pay to access their articles. Now, but with blockchain, you can have things like this. People who want to read that article of the author, they don't go through the publisher anymore. They don't go through the journal house anymore. You can contact the author directly. The author can actually fix a price for their articles. The author can say, okay, pay me 10,000 Naira to access my article. For the next person that is trying to access the article, the author can decide, Okay, I want to do eight thousand cities, not ten thousand naira anymore. You know, so the author actually calls the shot, not the publisher. So if you just eliminate yes, all of those guys, yeah. vendors, and publishers, you know, so everybody does transaction with the next person directly. It is peer to peer. All right, so that's one of the advantages. So I'm I'm taking it. I'm looking at it now and trying to reconcile it with the whole Web three point zero thing going on now. And okay. I think it's actually, it will work, like it will work very well. And we're low trust, in Africa here, we're low trust community. So this kind of transparent transaction where people can see what's going on. Um, in, in my dealings with authors in Nigeria here, I know one of the things people complain about is lack of transparency with publishers. Their royalties always have one story or the other to do. So I think this would yeah. work. And it reminds me of the article, which I'm giving my, my fourth essay for the, the residency on Creative Commons. I know you're aware of Creative Commons, where yeah. the, the reason the licenses encourage you to, you know, in fact, it gives the authors power to decide how their work wants to be used. And I found that when, when I was talking, when talking to authors here, it's very important to them that they decide how much, they, how their books can be used. Even the ones that want to give out free copies of their books, they are still skeptical. Like, hmm, if I give one person free now, I'll see it everywhere. That's what they want to do it out. You know, they want to be very gracious and give you a free copy of their book. So, but the whole lack of sec uh, security around, you know, how publishers handle books uh, and digital books anyway, um, deters them from giving out free books. So I think this works very well. And I'm I'm thinking of another area, which is the whole open access and you know open educational resources i think it's going to match like in terms of how you know e-learning will happen in africa i think this would also boost e-learning in africa if it happens because people now have access to you know information and i think that's what we need so thank you so much for this i think my next question um it's um, okay so i think you've also discussed the, the opportunities and challenges of blockchain uh, you mentioned some of them while you were speaking so i will talk about this because you are in love green libraries i've read your um, presentation on green library which i think i do think is awesome so my next question is this so some experts insist that blockchain technology is bad for the environment pointing to its high energy usage and carbon footprint while some experts say it isn't bad so as an advocate of green libraries and also we love blockchain, obviously, what's your view and why? Okay, <laughs> basically, um, as, as libra uh, libraries or library practitioners, um, I always tell us that people um, in our profession that we don't actually have to be miners. Where the problem yeah. is when people talk about blockchain and the environment is in mining. All right, okay. mining is actually, or miners are actually the guys that keep the system running, all right? Mm -hmm. So how do they do that? For every time a, a transaction goes on, 
for every time you and I, we do a transaction, right? A new block is created for that. How, do, how is that block created? Yeah. So this, uh, every transaction that happens on the blockchain technology comes out publicly to everyone on the platform as a puzzle. Now that puzzle, uh, you see people try to solve that puzzle. So what are they trying to solve actually? They are trying to verify that transaction that it is authentic, that this is a legitimate um, transaction. This transaction is worth having a block of its own. That's what they are trying to do. And when you're trying to solve the puzzle, it is not a puzzle that comes to you uh, as a question. It doesn't just come like, do you think this transaction is worth having a block? No, it comes in computer readable form. And so what these guys do is, you put in plenty of computers, like you can see my screen. That's what people do. A lot of computers, you have programmed them because this puzzle is mathematical, is computational, right? right? So you put a lot of systems together that you have programmed to do large, you know, mathematical uh, calculations and all of them, right. trying to verify that transaction, you know? And for every time a transaction is verified, Mm -hmm. The person who verified it, who put it up there, who put their proof of work that I actually did this work, I verified this, the person gets a reward, gets some Bitcoin, yeah, which is, if you, if you have to convert to any currency in the world, it's big money, all right, yeah. so they get a bit, so everybody, a lot of people just come together, try, try to mine, try to solve problems, try to verify blocks, try to create new blocks, to say, okay, I did this first and all of that. So libraries actually, uh, we don't have to go into all of this. Now, because we are using plenty of computers and these computers are using plenty of CPU power, all right? So it affects ele electricity and because it affects electricity, it affects the environment as well. Yeah. You know, yeah, the electricity that maybe a whole city or a whole country is supposed to use, some guys somewhere, only some guys are just using that electricity up, you know, trying to mine stuff with plenty of computers together. And the more you do that, especially where we use fossil fuel, um, yeah. there's plenty of gas emission in the air because it's plenty of electricity that we are using. All right. So what I, I think, my opinion is for, for libraries, mining, we don't have to concern ourselves with mining. All right. Let's just go into the platform use whatever technologies are available to provide services. For instance, many, many banks um, uh, provide some of their services on blockchain. Um, the users, the, the customers of the banks don't actually know if it's blockchain yeah. or not. That's none of their business, right? So that is how it should be for us in libraries as well. Uh, the user should not know what technology and all of that. And we don't have to go into the nitty gritty of mining. Let's just hop into the platform and just provide whatever service that we are, yeah, we are providing, you know, and that way we will not be among those contributing to depletion of our environment or the ozone layer or something and all of that. So that way is good for us. And quickly, let me let me add, um, before I, I I end this, where I know we skipped the opportunities and all of that, but let me just give an example to drive a message home. Um, let's imagine on, on blockchain that education goes to blockchain, for instance. I'm a teacher, you're a teacher, all of us here are teachers, lecturers in different universities in the world. Now, one of the reasons we know people have not gone to school today, it's not because they've not got the brains, it's because they've not got the money. Education is expensive, right? So imagine somebody in Kenya contacting me directly. The person knows that I teach in a university and I teach a particular course. The person says, okay, please, I'm willing to offer this money to you directly to teach me this course, all right? To prepare me for this course. Instead of paying their tuition to a university, which they can put all the money together. Mm -hmm. So I can decide to say, okay, I'll teach you. The person contacts another lecturer in Harvard another lecturer in Cambridge, another lecturer in University of Ghana and all of that. And we teach this person individually. The person then goes online, register for an exam. They pass the exam and they've got a certificate. So imagine what the advantages of blockchain. So people can contact people directly instead of going through the university, which is like a centralized um, system. So I'm just speaking of some of the opportunities of 
blockchain, you know? So instead of going through a centralized system, you do deals directly with whoever you're doing a deal with and life just becomes easy for us. So, but for the environment, this is what I have to say. Let's not bother ourselves with mining. Let's not bother ourselves with all of those things that consume power. Let's just focus on whatever services uh, or products that we are providing. And that's all, we don't contribute to um, environmental degradation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, my next question, um, it's, you already have it, but I'm going to frame it in a certain way. So you talked about um, people having access to, you know, creators right now through blockchain to get services directly. Um, but let's let's take a look at um, a platform like Amazon. Um, so you have independent authors, that is people who don't have publishers, so they just publish their work themselves. Now you have people who they could easily open up their blog, open up their own e-commerce site, but they choose not to do that. So instead, they just look for other platforms that they can put their book on, distribute it, and at the end of the year, they get their royalty. Now, it brings me to digital rights management because if on blockchain you can um, sell your book, like let's say offer your book to people directly, um, I'm not trying to consider DRM. So DRM exists when maybe a platform is giving, a platform is the one distributing your book and all that. So in a situation where, um, because I foresee that, yeah, tech, block, blockchain, great and all that, but I also know that the way people are wired to definitely get to a point where people be like, hmm, I still need a platform that if they want to like distribute these things, all I mean, maybe I can see what they're doing, but they should take care of everything surrounding it. So let's say a library is in that spot where they get to distribute people's book. Now, can the library decide, okay, let's put, okay, I'm trying to merge two questions now. Can a library decide, okay, let us put a price on this book for the author, and why we put a price for, on the book for the author that is in agreement with the author, can we also have like rights, digital rights management around this book? Um, I'm saying it because I'm also looking at, you know, I've been on blockchain platforms where I could download movies and all that for free. So it gets me wondering if it's actually, if it's going to provide that security that, you know, the regular publisher provides, online publisher provides with DRM, blockchain, can you have that DRM, you know, key around it that people, that will prevent people from, let's say, um, sharing it or using it for something else? Okay, uh, first of all, foremost, uh, let, let, let's talk about DRM, uh, digital rights management. Basically, what it's it's about is yeah. someone needs to be rewarded for their uh, intellectual property, right? And yeah. yeah, people shouldn't just copy without uh, acknowledging um, appropriately, without them getting their royalties or whatever is due them, right? And we want to see how we can stop all the piracy, and we want to see how we can make people get benefits for what they have, you know, labeled for. Right. So um, if you're talking about security, you, you know, blockchain is security in itself. All right. Yeah. So blockchain is actually um, a good form of acknowledging uh, or managing digital rights. Now, now, one of the things that you need to understand is if I have a soft copy of a book, an ebook, for instance, how do I know the origin where that book is from. I know the book has got an author, right? So yeah. who published the book online? All right. Who and who is supposed to get the royalty? Probably the author is getting the royalty, but who's the publisher? Who actually put that book online? Now, okay. in the blockchain um, network, remember that every transaction that is verified has a block. So the person who actually puts that, that, that book online has a block that says this is the first instance of this book, right? Mm -hmm. So you can actually trace or track the first instance of the publication of that book, right? So you actually know the first person that should be accorded um, whatever is student. So blockchain is actually a good platform for digital rights management because it tells you who put, who put the stuff first, 
who distributed the stuff, who transferred to the next person and all of that, you know? So, but uh, uh, for libraries, one thing that we need to understand is I, I need us to understand blockchain and libraries from two points of view. Now, if we are looking at our publishers and all those middlemen between the library and maybe the author of a book, you know, that is, we are taking away the middlemen. But in, in another sense, the library is a middleman. Oh my God. Yeah, it's so, yeah. So let us also, I want us to look at blockchain, you know, from a, a broad perspective. Yeah. Now let's assume the library. There is no central authority. Take your library, for instance. There is no Sylvia. There is no Adachuku. You guys are there, but the user of your library doesn't have anything to do with you guys. You know, the user just deals directly with whoever you're getting your books from. All right. You are you are you are you are curating, you are putting people's books in your collection, right? Now, yeah. so instead of the user going through you to read those books, the user contacts the person directly. Yeah. You know, so you are out of the game as well. You are not there. You know, so yeah. that is actually what a, a blockchain is. So, but for digital rights management, one of the things that you can do as a library, I don't know, I want. Is that David's uh, internet? Is everybody else there? Yeah, I'm here. Should okay. I'm here, please. Oh. Yep. Sorry, I think it cut off for a while. Okay. Okay, but well, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so quickly, uh, this is um, Adobe Digitization. This is one of the things. So what I'm trying to explain is the second part of your question. Um, mm -hmm. It is not only blockchain that can ensure digital rights management. Right, yeah. but blockchain is a good platform for it because it gives you track record of everything that happens, who published first, who distributed, and all of that. So blockchain is actually a good platform for that. Now, but it is not only blockchain. That's the second part of the question. Now, if, if, if you see outside blockchain, this is Adobe Digital Editions. These are books that I have read, uh, you know, a couple of months back. You know, if you see this book is showing expired, expired. Yeah expired this one is showing 19 days left you know for, for me to use this book so i actually borrowed these books from the library right yeah from different libraries and the way adobe digitization is programmed if the library tells you that this book is given to you for 21 days or for 14 days or seven days the book comes to you not as a book all right it comes as something that is encrypted i'm going to show you something now, if you look at uh, my screen, if you see this document, this particular document here, it's just showing 6176721. And the file type is not PNG like this. It's not PNG, it's not JPEG, it's not PDF. It's just showing Adobe content. Now, when I upload this into uh, Adobe Digitalization, and that particular book I just showed you is this book, Artificial Intelligence, right? Yeah. And yeah, so it appears as a book here. You know, and my time starts counting. You okay. know, so after 21 days, I, I borrowed the book for, I don't have access to this book again. It goes okay. like this one that's showing expired. I can't read it anymore. You know, yeah. it's gone. It's gone. So these are some of the technologies that libraries can adopt, you know, for digital rights management. There are many technologies like that, you know, so we can actually adopt these to help people manage, manage you know, yeah. their book. So it is not only blockchain. That has the power but what we are the, the good thing about blockchain is that it, it is transparent it gives mm -hmm. you track record of where it started from who did yeah. what who distributed and all of that so blockchain is actually a good platform for the okay uh, thank you so um the next question which i think you've actually actually explained that's it explain the concept of ownership on blockchain i think um you that so um okay the next one <laughs> all right i think we also covered this one the b2b subscription model okay 
Okay, first and foremost, I need to understand B2B from your own perspective. B2B is, you mean business to business, right? Yeah, so you know how intra, intra library law works? Let's say libraries decide, okay, I want to create um, this platform where I can distribute books and also enable other libraries subscribe to us to take books that which they can also distribute to their own users. So then the B2C is us directly to um, readers. That's yeah. the library directly to readers, yeah. So ask me the question again, just read the question. So, out, so okay, so can... the question I said can, um, let's say a commercial library operates a B2B and B2C model, can a blockchain accommodate a subscription model? Of course, that's uh, that, that's that's it's it's going on right now. All yeah. right, so a lot of companies are on blockchain technology and they do business with themselves. Let's always remember that the people who do the business actually, the the you don't actually have to know what technology. You know, yeah. <laughs> what you need to know is that the service is running. Money all right, money. so blockchain is not something that um, whether it can do this or it can't do this is a technology that you can program to do what you mm -hmm. want so it can actually two two libraries can actually yeah and that is something i i didn't mention that is one of the opportunities for libraries in yeah. library lending all yeah. right so let's assume that you've not got all the books in the world in your library right now you can't have all the books in the world even oclc that has got the biggest digital library in the world and Library of Congress that has got the biggest book collection in the world. They can't have all the books in the world. So one of the advantages of blockchain, let's talk about B2B now, library to library or company business to business. One of the advantages is that your users can, they don't have to go through you because you are in, you have some kind of partnership with yeah. OCLC or with, with Library of Congress or with another library in Ghana or in Nigeria or wherever, Sudan. Now, the users don't actually necessarily have to go through you, which is the traditional interlibrary lending or interlibrary yeah. business to business. You know, you contact your library that I need this book. The library says, okay, let's search among our partners if anyone has got this book. They find it in the Ameri in America. They say Library of Congress has got the book. They contact library. No. The user right now, because you have partnership with Library of Congress, the user contacts Library of Congress directly. Congress. Yeah. All right. So it is pair to pair. You know, they contact Library of Congress directly. Yeah. Library of Congress verifies um, their rights to contact them or to own the book or to read the book. They say, okay, this guy is a user of one of our partner libraries. And they do business with the person directly, not with you. All right. You know, so it is one good way of um, so this this way um, it it actually helps the two libraries can communicate now a library and and the users that's b two c right now can actually communicate so yeah. however you want communication to the, the most important thing is that two people or two groups of people can communicate whether business to customer. Uh, library to user, or library to library, and all of that. Blockchain accommodates all of that. Communication is just interesting on blockchain technology. Thank you. So my final question, so I can give everyone time to ask. Um, so considering our reality in Africa, in terms of digital literacy, tech access and adoption, will a library designed on blockchain be attractive to the regular African reader and then the others? Okay, I think we've answered that question also. First and foremost, uh, the user doesn't have to know the technology. <laughs> the user doesn't have to know how the library runs, all right? So what they are concerned about is, is the service that I seek available? Is the book or the information or product that I seek available? All right? So yeah. the African, the basic um, African library user doesn't have care if it runs on blockchain or it runs on another kind of chain on all of that. Long yeah, so long as the service is available, that's yeah. what happens. So the question, I think, let me put it this way. As Africans, generally, as humans, not only Africans, are we ready to adopt blockchain technology? Because it's got its own, um, it's got its own challenges. It's got its own um, downside, 
uh, you know, which people fear for. Like I just looked at the chat. I saw something. Somebody said, so uh, blockchain makes us redundant. <laughs> All right. You know, so these are some of the fears. Um, it's like you don't matter anymore if somebody decides not to do any business with you and wants to contact your partner directly, yeah. blockchain allows yeah. them to. All right. So are we willing to go into that kind of transaction? Yeah, especially if, if you're a commercial library, for instance, people pay to use your library. So are you willing uh, for your users to not go through you and enjoy one of your services provided by one of your partners? They go directly to your partner and not through you. Are you willing to accept that kind of technology? So are we willing to, you know, everything that blockchain is about is decentralized, it is distributed. Are we willing to accept a technology that is transparent? Let us tell ourselves the truth. I don't mean any slides to my beloved Africa. No, not, yeah. it's not an African thing. Generally, people are dishonest. All right, yeah. people are dishonest, but we've seen that in governance in Africa. All right, a lot of our politicians are dishonest in Africa. So are we actually willing to accept a technology that would, wouldn't give us room to be dishonest anymore? If somebody, uh, my, my brother, or let, let me assume that I own the library, for instance, or let me say Sylvia, for instance, that, that you know, the founder of the library, Sylvia has got siblings, my brothers and sisters who would like to use your library. And ideally people are, are, are supposed to pay. Uh, Sylvia, I'm sorry, it's just an example, all right? It's just, um, so people are supposed to pay to use the library, but this is family we are talking about here. And you've got a book that your brother needs to write an exam, you know? And he's supposed to pass through the system, pay some money and all of that, you know? But because this is family, I, this person, I don't want them to pay. And all of that. So how do we boycott the system and all of that? So let's see a, a system that is very transparent. The question is, are we willing to accept that kind of system? You know, that doesn't allow us to do um, anything that we shouldn't do. All right, so that is it. So that, that's actually the question. It's not about the library user. The library user doesn't care what technology, just provide the service and the product. It's about us as humans, generally if we are willing to allow such technology to thrive. Yeah. Yeah, um, because I'm, just, I'm also looking at the whole point of copyright issues with the whole dishonesty. So imagine, because like you said, um, the first person to put it on the blockchain technology is noted as the first point. So um, yeah. if in Africa, we don't create um, copyright laws that will really protect people especially in terms of the digital access and content that we have now, then I think it's going to be a whole lot of problem for like to, to birth a new problem for us. Um, when people begin, you know what's happening with private libraries right now? Yeah. So yeah. Imagine that sort of thing, like people just take up your book and then set it up on their own platforms and maybe register it as theirs or something like that. So yeah. Um, I, I, I get it now. So thank you so much. I'm really, I'm really grateful. Um, okay, Poisa, yes. Thank you so much. So um, Sylvia, Osad, Nana, Seth, does anyone have any question? I think I'm done. <laughs> okay, thank you, Adela, and thank you, um, David, so much. Um, I've personally learned a whole lot because when it comes to technology at this kind of level and scale I'm totally ignorant I have to say and so when you talk about like the user doesn't have to know what technology is being used as a library owner I definitely have to know so I've been enlightened a lot so yeah. I thank you for that um, you. I would ask um, a question about um, how easy it is to use blockchain from a, a librarian's perspective or a library owner's perspective I mean how do you access it how do you incorporate it into your systems is it affordable and you know i would consider lotad to be quite an innovative uh, library um but for a kind of like community library somewhere in you know not in accra and somewhere rural like how easy is it to use this technology to start using it okay so um um thanks uh, for for the opportunity to talk about something that i didn't talk about before that's one of the challenges all right um it's not something that is easy 
uh, to use. Now, uh, you, may, you may have guys who have got the skills. Yeah, the technical part is not your problem. Uh, the technical part, you can actually pay programmers or people to, do, to build a platform for you. You can download software that are already um, available, you can buy. But the part that I'm concerned about is using the technology that you've got, that you've paid for, that you've built right now. So that's one of the problems that we'll have. You know, that's one of the challenges of, it's not easy for people to actually understand the platforms, all right? Um, that is that is not everybody's problem anyway. There are people on the platform who understand it, they are using it. But this is a library we are talking about. Both the library staff and the staff of the organization, the users of the library, everyone should know how to use the technology. And currently, that is not the case. It is not easy at all. So uh, myself, I downloaded a blockchain wallet uh, at some point to do some transactions. I, I didn't use it a lot for a long time. I didn't really understand what I was doing. You know, so basically anytime I download the technology before going online to see how to use it and all of that, I try to figure it out myself because I'm, a, I'm an advocate of uh, good user experience. Everything should be user friendly. So if I can't figure it out myself, I wonder people who are not tech savvy like myself, it's going to be difficult. So it is not easy. That's just the... Yeah, but if you have to build a platform or you have to pay people to get the platform set up for you, that's not uh, a problem for them because they are technical guys. But you have to do a lot of training. You have to understand it yourself. Train and retrain and retrain people for everybody to be on the um, same platform. You know, but I'm not discouraging you. Banks are using it. People are using it. So you can actually go over to the platform, learn how to use it and begin to teach it. Yeah, your people don't have to know the platform anyway. Just learn how to use it yourself and begin okay. to write things so you can. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else uh, have a question, Seth? Yes, uh, I have a few questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for your um, Wonderful presentation. Uh, I have uh, two questions. The first one is that you were you talked about uh, smart application, which I was a little bit curious about because uh, we do apply rare books for our library. So I'm, I'm quite curious about how uh, it's going to work practically. If I know I've put up a request, uh, a set of requirement as to what material I want, but then in a real world, how does it work? Because this is not a, an electronic material, it's actually a physical book. I have coffee books, so how do I like actually know that I'm paying somebody who is actually going to get a material to me? That's the first question. And then the second okay. one is, you know, the, the, the conventional library system actually have uh, user access. The, the users actually, uh, uh, most of these platforms actually record the activity of users. So how is that different from uh, a blockchain technology? Because the, the conventional software do something similar. They record activity of all users when you log in, when you log out, what did you do? Did you like uh, change anything? They do actually record that. So how is, is this different from uh, uh, conventional software uh, technology that actually you uh, in library? Okay. So I'll, I'll take it from the second question because that one is easy for me to forget. Okay, so the difference is actually huge. Um, in a conventional library, let's say you have a software that you're using, you record all your activities. Remember, I'm the tech guy. Even if you are the one managing the software, maybe I'm the tech guy, the overall tech guy in the organization. I can undo. You don't even have an idea that I have undone something, all right? I can destroy records. Nobody even knows that I have destroyed records. There is no track of what I have done. You can make a mistake and claim you are not the one who made the mistake. You can actually do stuff. And so because the software doesn't tell who does what and all of that, you know? So the software itself can crash, all right? We don't have a software anymore. We've been hacked or our server has virus, has got virus and is down, you know? But it's with blockchain, there is no such thing. Now, so in your library, in the conventional library system, um, you keep records of stuff, all right? That record is not distributed among everyone. Uh, the record, everyone may have access through the network. We may be seeing your records, but we don't have it because that thing still resides in the server. 
But let's assume that you make copies and you send to all of us. It is possible for all of us to lose that record. And what if you tell us one day and say, no, that record that we've got, let's, it, it, it's not valid anymore. We destroy the record. But blockchain is not like that. Blockchain, you have records. If I try to undo your record, my action, a block is created for my action. The original record that you've got is still there. It's not destroyed. You don't rewrite anything in blockchain. You don't change anything, all right? So the change, what you call a change is a new block that says this person did this thing. But the orig original records that you've got are still there. Nothing has changed, all right? So, um, so every single thing that you do is still there. So 20 years from now, uh, if we go back to check everything that your library has been doing, Let's say, for instance, something happens, earthquake or something, and your library doesn't exist. We lose the server, we lose the books, we lose everything. Remember, the blockchain is a distributed ledger. Um, that record, it does not, it, it doesn't reside in your library. It is sent to everyone in the world. <laughs> All right. So from anybody, anyway, you can recover the, the data, you know, that is lost. And it is not you that does that. The system automatically does that distributes that all right to everybody so i don't know if that answers the question so blockchain is is quite different yeah, it does. yeah. yeah. then the second one yeah. is thank uh, you um, yeah the basic acquisition library acquisition basically what libraries do when they want to acquire let me give you from a broad perspective you are a special library you may not do the details that i want to explain but basically this is what libraries do First and foremost, uh, you may have a list of books that you want to buy. Uh, prepare a list, um, select them carefully and say, we need this book and all of that. Now, you send it out to book vendors. Maybe you've got one or two vendors that you do deals with, or you want to just make it open. Send someone a firm order, supply us this book. The person checks if they've got it in their warehouse. If they've not got it in their warehouse, they go to the market or meet all their partners, but somehow they supply you the book. You come back, you verify that, okay, these are the books that I need and all of that. You guys begin to talk about how to pay the person and all of that. Now in blockchain, it is different. Um, you've, you're dealing with physical books and you want to go over to blockchain, all right? You, you don't intend having the e-version of these books that you've got in your library currently, all right? So, but you can actually transact with the records, the bibliographic details of the book that you've got in your library. You just want to let your users know that we've got this book in our library, all right? So it's not like you want to buy the digital version of it. Now, you need new books, smart contracts, smart acquisition. What you do is that we need this kind of book, or you just say we need any book um, that is written by someone of African descent. Um, you put the books that you don't want, that we've got this already. These are the books that we need, any other. You set the conditions, you program the system, you set the conditions. You already put a price. Whoever meets this condition, pay this person instantly. So you don't bother yourself with expecting books from the, from the vendor. You don't give yourself that headache. If they supply the books, you don't bother yourself with verifying the books if they actually meet your specifications. You don't bother yourself with how are we going to pay this person? Pay 70% of the money first when they make the supply of it. You don't bother yourself with all of that. You've programmed your system. The person meets your condition. The person supplies the physical books to your library. Have you go back to your system and say, okay, this person has supplied this book. You just click a button and all of that. Or the person clicks the button on their end to say transaction completed. You see it on your end and you say, you confirm and the person got, gets their money, which is already provided and all of that. So blockchain just makes it very easy, all right? So whether you're dealing with physical books or we, and if you're dealing with eBooks, it's easier. It's just easiest because when the person does the supply of eBooks to your own blockchain technology, sent to your library on blockchain technology, you don't have to verify. The system verifies if the list of books that you sent is what the person has supplied. And if it is the list of books and the person says transaction, the system just pays the person and all of that. So it's a simple um, platform, you know, bottlenecks, you know, so that's it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I just want to add something to the question you just answered. 
uh, so you, you know the the the, the uh, companies like let me say the, the conventional e-commerce companies like let's say Amazon and the rest. They have yeah. this thing called the escrow account they use. So what they do is that when you buy something from them, maybe it's the, the product is actually uh, the store actually belongs to a third party, right? Mm -hmm. So the vendor is not paid directly. The money is put in an escrow account, and then when they meet. Uh, the side of the contract, I can they deliver the books to the person or the, whatever product you, you bought to the person and you meet the requirement and the person confirms that they've received it, then the money is paid to the vendor. So uh, but what you said uh, imply that uh, blockchain can do something similar. Where, where the money will be hanging and I trust that the money is hanging. So I send the product to you or the book to you and then when it gets to you and then you confirm that this is what you wanted, then I get my money. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the opportunities or one of the advantages of blockchain is that it takes away every form of um, all kind of uh, middlemen, all kind of middle stuff. So it saves you time and your money. Like like here, the last uh, point I have here, no intermediaries. So you don't actually need intermediaries in blockchain, all right? Especially when you're paying the person digitally, all right? You just set your conditions. So long as somebody meets the con, you don't care who the person is. You don't care who, who is doing the supply. You know, you don't care about the vendor. You don't care about their reputation, whether they are new in the business or they are old in the business, if they are competent or not. You've set your conditions. Anybody who meets the condition, pay this person who meets the condition. So that's why it is called smart contract, smart acquisitions. You know, so that's what blockchain does. Yeah. All right. Okay, um, thank you so much, David. It's been very, very wonderful. And thank you for enlightening us, educating us. Um, of course, privately, I'll be reaching out to you. I don't know if you can share your email with us um, for those of us who might like to reach out to you personally. Um, that would be great. But thank you so much. I, it's really been wonderful having this session with you for teaching us. I've learned more about blockchain than all the YouTube videos I've been watching, to be honest. So thank you so much. Um, Silvia, do you have anything to add? Yes, um, obviously um, Ada has said it all, but on behalf of the Library of Africa and the African diaspora, and also on behalf of all of our digital residents, we would really like to thank you for your time and for your energy and for um, teaching us or teaching me at least I can say about something that I know nothing about at all, but I will certainly be looking into it and looking into how we here at the library can um, incorporate and use blockchain if at all possible. So I just say thank you so much for your time. Um, and yes, that's it really. And thank you. Yes, and I see all sort of clapping as well. So yes, let's give let's give a virtual round of applause uh, for David. That's excellent. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And thank every you. everybody else, I just say very quickly. Um, see you on Thursday at um, four o'clock GMT, five o'clock West African time, yeah. and um, the next Lotad Pro Talk will be the final one, which will be on Friday. Uh, this coming Friday, 26th of November at uh, five o'clock uh, GMT and uh, six o'clock West African time. And that will be with Patrice Joa, who I think you can read about obviously in the guide, a former Miss Liberia, um, who is uh, an advocate for uh, children's literacy and just literacy in general, um, but also entrepreneurship within the creative writing space. And that will be uh, Patrice in conversation with Nanama Addo. So, Thank you all very much and uh, see you on. And thank you, Ada, of course. Thank you, Ada, for, uh, uh, for steering this conversation so ably. And um, yeah, see you all on Thursday. Thank you, all right, thank you guys for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all right, bye. Thank you David. See you. Bye. bye.